uh, let's say, first full day of the, the ERSA uh, summer school. Uh, I hope you had a nice uh, evening yesterday. Usually one of the highlights of uh, summer schools like these is uh, watching football together in an international context. But um, here in the Netherlands, we were quite happy that we could suffer on our own without people from other countries making jokes about uh, the performance of our, of our team. So let's uh, start talking about uh, content <laughs> quickly. Uh, so it's... Uh, uh, really uh, uh, nice to, uh, to have Uske Erna as the first uh, uh, keynote speaker after the introductory lecture of Evelyn uh, yesterday. Uh, but before uh, I would like to introduce Uske to you, I would like to mention uh, that the elevation pitches that you have all submitted uh, can be found if you go to the ERSA um, uh, platform and then click on the, on the timeline uh, button and then go to the 26th of June. So that's actually before the summer school uh, started. And from there, you can actually watch by clicking play uh, the uh, recorded sessions. You can watch the uh, elevator pitches that were submitted by all the other participants. So that's a nice way of getting to know each other uh, more than uh, you do already after having met in Gather Town uh, yesterday. Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's go to the to the session of, of today, the first session. Again, uh, I'm honored uh, to introduce to you uh, Uske Erner. She's a lecturer in spatial economics and real estate at the Department of Land Economy at the University of Cambridge, where she's also a fellow in economics and land economy at Sydney Sussex College. She did her bachelor in Turkey and uh, at Marmara University, and then she continued doing her master at the University of Jönköping in Sweden uh, with, and that's of course very important, an exchange semester here at the University of, uh, of Groningen. And then, <laughs> and then in uh, 2014, she uh, got her PhD also from Jönköping, uh, the International Business School. And during that time, she also became a prominent member of the so-called real uh, mafia. Uh, that's the group of young researchers uh, that attended uh, or that went actually to uh, real at the University of Urbana Champaign, the group led by uh, Jeff Ewings for a very long, long time. And then in April 2018, she uh, went to, uh, to Cambridge. And in the meantime, she is still affiliated with the Research Institute of Industrial uh, Economics in, in Stockholm. She published in virtually all regional science journals, so in Journal of Regional Science, in papers in regional science, regional studies, spatial economic analysis, and a few, uh, few others. And recently, uh, she also um, uh, published a book on tourism and the uh, hospitality uh, industry with, uh, with Springer, I think. And then uh, something about her research interests. Uh, she has a wide ranging interest, I think. So she has published on retail and service geography, on the geography of institutions, uh, on the geography of entrepreneurship. And she actually won a prestigious prize, the Young Researcher Award 2019 of the Entrepreneurship Forum in, in Sweden. Uh, but today she will talk about one of her other main research interests, the microgeography of segregation and ethnic enclaves. Uh, that's the main topic of her, of her talk. Uh, so Uske will talk for about an hour, maybe a few minutes more. And then afterwards, uh, there will be ample opportunities for Q&A. Um, so Uske indicated clearly that she uh, prefers to have, let's say, oral questions. Uh, so uh, you will be, uh, be become a so-called panelist in this session after uh, Uske has uh, concluded her, her talk. And then you can raise your hand and indicate that you would like to, to ask a question. So hopefully there will be a lot of discussion after the session. So I think we uh, should start as quickly as possible. So Uske, I would like to give the floor to you. Thank you so thank you so much, Bart. I mean, uh, this was a, an amazing introduction, which probably cut through a couple of my slides, uh, which is going to save me some time. Uh, uh, also, um, hello everybody. I'm. I, I should start by saying that when I got the email with the uh, subject line saying "Arsa Summer School in Groningen," I didn't read the rest of the email, not even the dates, and just I hit reply and said yes, I would very much like to come. Even as a student, I would like to come back. Uh, 
to Groningen under any circumstances. It's a city that I, I admire uh, so much, and and I, and I would have, I would have loved to be there right now, actually, with, with all of you, and perhaps uh, head to a pub after the sessions and 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 enjoy the and enjoy the informal uh, and serendipitous conversations that that we could have uh, enjoyed. But we will have to postpone them for for some other time in the future. Uh, this is a small and tightly knit community. So I'm almost certain that I will meet uh, everybody in person eventually if I haven't done uh, already. Uh, and uh, this is going to be um, a little bit of a messy uh, set of uh, slides rather than showing you uh, one or two papers quite in detail and, and walking through every single coefficient and every aspect of the identification. I thought I could make a nice collage of, of things that I'm, I've been working on related to microgeography of ethnic enclaves, um, because I believe most of the details that I would share with you, you can access and, and get in touch with me and communicate about them uh, later. But perhaps if I can present you a, a, a broader picture on, on this uh, literature, um, it, it may be more useful uh, both, both for you and, and, and for me uh, at the end of the day in terms of uh, what kind of interaction we can have. Uh, but before microgeography of ethnic enclaves, I put together a, a, a few slides to talk about why do we talk about microgeography at all. So this is a this is a rather new term, somewhat a made-up term, you may call it. Uh, it started with microeconometrics in the mainstream econ literature um, that that the access to microdata and, and better computational power led to an exponential increase in the number of papers that deal with. Um, and micro, micro issues, microeconomic issues. And of course, there was some uh, what the spillover effect um, that we observed in, in urban and, and regional economics literature, likewise. Uh, the theories that, that allowed us to think about space in a hierarchical fashion uh, could finally be actu actualized in, in empirical work um, now that we had this really fantastic data to work with. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite lucky that by the time I started my PhD, um, this type of data became more and more available to uh, young uh, scholars like, like me. And most of the things that I will show um, uh, are collaborations with, uh, with a bunch of people um, that work on similar topics or related topics that deal with microgeography. Uh, so um, I would rather give you a teaser, uh, so to say, into a, a broader literature than, than talk about only one or two papers, I thought. And I hope this is going to be the right strategy to go with. Um, I am not going to show this as a slide, by the way, because I can't move my cursor so much. If you have any difficulty seeing or reading something, because some of the slides are going to be too wordy, just remind me some stuff, uh, please uh, let me know. We can try to sort the problem out uh, right away. I'm not going to spend so much time on who uh, I am. Bart uh, presented uh, me in, in, in such a... Um, and a nice fashion that I would uh, I would very much like to record and use in every presentation I have, if if, if it was possible. Uh, but you can call me a, an under uh, an undercover economist among the geographers and an undercover geographer among the economists, uh, as it is the case with most of the economists in our in our um, community. I would like to think. Um, so we are a little bit homeless uh, to that end in, in in either of the camps. Uh, I worked in a very mainstream environment in Stockholm prior to moving to Cambridge, uh, which is a very eclectic environment with lawyers, geographers, planners, and economists. And there they thought what I was doing was standard geography. And now among the sort of spatial scientists uh, or, or urban studies people, urban sociologists and so on, I'm one of the hostile uh, economists trying to take over their literature. So it's always a little bit confusing to be in, in this situation, but also fun because this pushes you to understand um, more than your own uh, territory because you need to be prepared uh, for when somebody shows up and says, but are you aware of the fact that this question is already asked and answered by urban sociology some 70 years ago? So you need to be, so you need to be aware of uh, the world outside of your own, own realm. And, and this has been a both tiring and, and joyful uh, journey for me, which I uh, wholeheartedly recommend to um, everybody. Um, so uh, agenda for today, as I said, that is it's going to be a few slides of back to basics and then I'll start talking about a bunch of cases. Um, these are some of them are published papers um, and the others are still cooking uh, on microgeography of ethnic enclaves. Um, 
So with some things that I will present uh, today, I feel more confident uh, than with others. And I think this is also the, the um, interesting part with this literature that it is seemingly old in terms of the questions asked, but when you look at the empirical work, it's uh, evolving um, rather rapidly um, with, again, um, different type of data and different cases uh, from different geographies. So first, back to basics. A couple of years ago, I remembered that when I started studying economics, um, I had this in my first year, something like a political econ, uh, uh, economic sociology type of uh, course, um, which had nothing to do with urban and regional science. And there, there was a, a, a quote from, or, or a, a, a part of um, Borges' uh, book on exactitude of science, this Argentinian philosopher, writer, and poet, uh, who, who talks about... Um, the desire of scientists basically to depict the world as precisely as, as humanly possible, which um, for which he uh, uses cartographers, uh, so science of cartography um, uh, as a case basically, um, and says sort of these cartographers started making maps larger and larger and larger to the extent that the map became as large as the empire itself basically. And then they realized rather quickly that uh, a map as big as the empire itself was pretty useless because it was very difficult to actually use it for any purpose. Uh, and then this map was torn apart. And today you can still find the pieces of this map sort of in a very poetic fashion uh, in, in different parts of the empire. So um, uh, this hit me just a couple of years ago that actually it's, it, we are all trying to sort of exactitude our science of geography uh, using several quantitative methods all the time and doing so uh, the game or the nature of the game changed rather uh, dramatically over the past 15 years or so, I would say. So um, while I thought what I was doing was sort of rocket science working with the kind of data I was working at the beginning of my PhD, now when a research assistant sends their due files, it takes me a while to crack uh, which loop is in a loop in a loop in a loop and let alone all of these different modules that are available for different types of spatial data science uh, it's impossible to catch up with everything that's happening around data and data work so um, I, I thought it's also a good place for all of us to sort of take a step back and think about why we started crunching these numbers the way we do um, to capture what what's the essence of the question a little bit and it all for the empirical work that I am at least accustomed to, it started with the era of urbanism, right? Um, so the ideas around traditional location theories have been around for a, for a very long time, since late or mid 1800s almost. Um, but people started to pay attention to these ideas and their empirical use at the very least when they observed this dramatic increase in urban population. And urban thinkers, these are not even uh, academics like Jane Jacobs, which I believe most of you are familiar with, this wonderful, lovely lady who uh, made it uh, her lifelong mission to protect the um, uh, sort of this organic nature of cities uh, against quote unquote evil planners, um, uh, made the obvious point that most of the questions that we ask in relation to economy um, requires us to move beyond these uh, national borders, these political entities, these arbitrarily defined borders that, that we are accustomed to deal with in, in science, in political science, as well as in, in, in economics, right? Um, so we need to look, at, look into cities, she says. And now we are sort of making yet another push and say, okay, so city is perhaps too large to observe some of the mechanisms that we're talking about, that we need to even uh, even further our uh, resolution and, and look into smaller units um, to understand um, some of the assumed interactions uh, between the agents that we model uh, or we modeled in our theories uh, very for a very, very long time. What's the standard uh, narrative here? Population and economic activities unevenly distributed across space. These disparities are very large, but they're also very persistent. We observe a lot of path dependency in geography, right? Um, sociologists, uh, anthropologists uh, like to call this memory of space, sort of geographical memory, right? Things are embedded in people, but they're also embedded in space. So even when you shuffle the population around, some of, some of the, the um, sort of history lingers uh, in, in space. So 
these things that we observe, these disparities in any uh, population distribution or, or distribution of economic activity tend to persist for a very long time. Uh, and also the, they are not random to the extent that uh, we may not be able to fully model uh, the, the empirical regularity around them, but, but we are pretty confident around a few of the determinants that can explain these disparities in more than one geography, so to say, right? And one thing that is on top of these things that I discussed a lot, that is not discussed enough, in my opinion, in our sort of community, is the spatial hierarchy. What do we mean by spatial hierarchy? That there is a hierarchical organization in space. So we start with the country. We have territories. These are regions. Um, a bunch of cities are nested within these regions, right? And city, whatever city is, and that's a very long discussion that we could have for maybe another three hours or so. We could have the epistemologic discussion around it, the uh, origin of the uh, term or what it means in different empirical contexts. But cities are also quite organic um, entities um, that contain these pockets of people and, and economic activity, the neighborhoods. Again, the neighborhood is also a, a, can, can be a rather ambiguous term, right? What do we mean by a neighborhood in the context of Netherlands, for example, can be entirely different if we compare it with um, a developing country, example, like Turkey. Uh, what a city is in Sweden is an entirely different thing than what a city is in the UK. Uh, so, but, but essentially, this it's not necessarily a uniform um, definition of these terms, but rather the fact that this kind of hierarchical arrangement is something we observe in every geography is, is something I'd like to highlight. So this all brings us to spatial economics. Uh, I'm sure so many of you are already familiar with the basic assumptions and, and axioms of spatial economics, but perhaps some, uh, some of you are joining from outside of the circle of urban and regional science. So for those of you, it should be a, a welcoming slide, I hope. Um, so what we really essentially care about is unit of reference, right? Um, something uh, is happening in, in the economy uh, with regards to individual agents, firms, or some sectors, uh, or some institution, whatnot. Uh, our it, it sort of uh, reflex is, is to ask with geography. So where does this happen? Uh, does, is, this a, is this an issue related to region? Is this an issue related to city or, or is, this, is this phenomenon happening at the neighborhood level? Uh, and unlike the general equilibrium framework, we have spatial equilibrium, right? The utilities are assumed to be constant across uh, space and the space is again defined by some uh, hierarchical level that it's often the city in the literature. And um, it, the utility consists of um, a bunch of things, uh, including rents and um, uh, amenities uh, as well as wages uh, and since people and uh, capital are assumed to be mobile as it reflects reality uh, more closely uh, we observe these trade-offs between uh, between different features of, of geographies to achieve the same level of utility or to be as content as, as as sort of possible for individuals that are trying to individually optimize their location or firms that are trying to optimize their location across different locations. And doing so, um, the idea of amenities, of, of, of course, are, are introduced. Such a broad concept, again, that captures features of, features of space. Uh, but here, we very much like development economists talk a lot uh, about first nature versus second nature, causes of spatial inequality. Uh, so what comes from the innate immutable or rather slowly changing features of the geography and what comes from um, man-made efforts or uh, sort of things that do not change over time or things that change very, very incrementally so versus things that are shaped by the very people that live there. So try to sort of make uh, a distinguish, uh, sort of we are trying to distinguish these two sets of spatial features from one another. Sometimes you hear about these things as endogenous versus exogenous spatial elements, right? And they are very codependent on each other. They are not entirely orthogonal. They're not orthogonal at all, actually, uh, with one another. And um, a concept that is uh, that it keeps appearing in the literature, no matter what you study, may that be ethnic enclaves or, or, or uh, entrepreneurship or institutions, whatnot. Uh, the concept of agglomeration uh, or economies keep appearing here. Um, 
uh, there are two important concepts that are that are related to agglomeration economies. Of course, the first one is the increasing returns to scale and uh, is, uh, sort of space level spatial indivisibilities. And the second part is externalities, which is extremely important for me now that I'm actually work, doing a lot of work at, at the neighborhood level, right? Um, and I'm not going to spend any time on these two concepts, assuming that that most of you are familiar with with the with the two. Uh, but just to remember, uh, why do we care about agglomeration so much so that it appears on, in almost all questions we ask in um, urban slash regional uh, science is that um, we like to think or, uh, over and above um, other types of explanations that are available in other uh, types of literature. There are three micro foundations that help us explain, uh, that help us understand the very existence of cities. These mechanisms are the things that you may again be familiar with, such as sharing, matching, and learning. Um, these are almost like whole eternities of, of, of uh, the agglomeration literature, pretty much. Um, and we like to think that um, the sort of agglomeration is about centripetal forces, uh, so things that pushes things that, that things that push agents away from um, sort of clustered areas, uh, agglomerated uh, areas, and it's. To my experience, at the very least, every time I have a conversation with peers and, and students, when I ask them to define things that they find repellent in an area, things that they don't like in a city, um, I, I find that it's much easier for them to define the things that they don't like or they don't appreciate in a city, things like congestion, crime, um, affordability uh, matters. But when you start thinking about the things that pull you to a city, Yes, you can come up with a, a few tangible examples for why the city is the city that you should be in and, and the city that you like, uh, but, but we fall somehow short because some of the things, these centrifugal uh, forces, things that actually pull people to cities are uh, not e easy to observe directly and their direct quantification, uh, their direct measurement and the quantification of their effect is, is quite difficult. So that's the empirical game that the agglomeration economies literature has been playing back and forth, trying to execute in Borges's uh, words, uh, the science of, of agglomeration economy. So what, what leads to cities grow so big, uh, why some of them stop growing or uh, stagnate in their growth rate and why some cities shrink, right? As trying to understand the mechanisms behind them. And here these three mechanisms this is just a very gentle reminder to those of you who are already familiar with the concept and perhaps an introduction to those of you who are not that familiar with the concept. Um, this is a nice painting from Fra Carnevale um, that depicts what an ideal city is. It's not a, an actual city, but it puts together a bunch of elements that you would like to have in his vision in an ideal city. Uh, you have the Colosseum for the entertainment, you have the courthouse, you have the religious institutions, you have a nice uh, square where people can gather for all sorts of reasons. So this kind of infrastructure, the actual physical infrastructure, institutional infrastructure, cultural infrastructure that is possible to have in space only if you have um, a, a critical mass of people populating the place, right? So sharing essentially is, is all about that. So how can you make it financially feasible to have or technically feasible to have in some in some cases when we're talking about cultural institutions and so on um some elements uh, how can how can it be feasible for us to have them what's the minimum number of people that needs to be around us for the cost of that thing to be shared it's very much similar to if you come from a more mainstream uh, econ um, side of things, it's very, very much similar to uh, the theory of clubs. Uh, we often talk about the Sigmodian curve, right? Like, right? like an S-shaped curve. You need a, a minimum number of people to cover the costs of something to be shared. This can be some basic infrastructure like a neighborhood pool or some urban uh, transport structure, right? Uh, then with every additional member into that club, quote unquote club or that population, uh, the cost of having these things uh, diminish, uh, but it's not uh, linearly so, this trend, to the extent that at one point, the returns that you can have uh, from having an additional member peaks, beyond which having yet another 
uh, thousand or million people in the city may not necessarily deliver uh, desirable outcomes. That's where you have this optimum city size type of uh, literature, right? So can we actually estimate uh, the optimum size for a city with respect to what kind of determinants? In certain cases, we even observe this inverse U shape with every additional member beyond the peak point. Not only you are not deriving any further benefits in terms of sharing, sharing of things available to you, but also it may even be detrimental um, since it can create some crowding out effect. So sharing, sharing of infrastructure, again, sharing of input suppliers for firms, sharing of a large labor pool, um, et cetera. So th these are the kinds of things that are discussed in this context. What do we have next is matching. Uh, this is again, a painting from Ford Maddox Brown, it's called Work. Um, maybe you guys may not be familiar with this, but in my, in my childhood coming from again, a, semi-developed developing country case, uh, there were these work, work markets, uh, basically, and before internet, people would go there, jobless people or people that work on a daily basis. Um, and if you needed sort of manual labor, uh, you would go there and pick people and hire for the day, uh, so, so to say. Uh, it's kind of heartbreaking that FedEx Brown, uh, Maddox Brown um, depicts this from, uh, from the 1800s of, of Europe. Um, so, so it's this idea that you need a certain skill set, you need somebody to, to do the job for you as an employer, and people need jobs, um, and there are more or less ideal jobs in the labor market, and uh, the size of the labor market, local labor market, allow for two things. One is um, the probability of a match, uh, because we know that the probability of a match between an employer and, a, and an employee increases with, with urban size but also quality of the match improves with, with urban size. And again, in, not, in a, not in a linear fashion either, but I'm not gonna spend so much time on that, those non-linearities that we observe in, in quality and the probability of matching that's driven by, uh, by agglomeration. And the third thing, the thing that is closest to my heart because it is probably the sort of most sort of catch all micro foundation in agglomeration literature is learning. Uh, here is yet another painting by Raphael. This is School of Athens, depicting all sorts of philosophers that actually did not live during the same period in history, uh, but this sort of idealized to meet in, in, in a square, bump into each other, have open debate, open discussions about ideas, these serendipitous encounters that lead to uh, stimulant and creative thoughts uh, and all these wonderful ideas, sort of. This is, this is, but this is what we think learning mechanism is about in cities, right? And uh, there's an, an enormous literature in learning from mimicking to role models, from peer effects to leader follower models. So how do we actually improve our understanding of our know-how, um, understanding of something or our know-how of doing something in a non-codified fashion by just being in a place? I think uh, the most remarkable example around this is, is universities, right? Uh, there, there, was, there were some interesting papers, for example, that showed the probability of two people uh, collaborating on a paper with respect to the distance between their offices at, at, at university buildings. Um, so how actually having uh, these unplanned serendipitous interactions can lead to sort of productive means is, is the idea in the context of learning. But also these peer effects, uh, which is most relevant for my work when it comes to microgeography of ethnic enclaves. So how information travels um, among, among the peers and what kind of features do you require to have um, in a subpopulation? What kind of geographical features also do you want to have or would you require for this learning to lead to desirable outcomes. And in crime, there are similar questions that try to investigate how these things may actually lead to undesirable outcomes, for example, right? Or when you look at dark side of social capital type of literature. So um, this actually is much about uh, the neighborhoods and how the hierarchical system is organized. I'm gonna spend just a few minutes on this. Uh, again, as a reminder to those of you who are already familiar with this line of work, but um, as an introduction to those of you who are not. Um, Order Without Design is the title of a book by uh, Alain Berteau as a planner, um, an economics uh, friendly planner um, 
who works on the field for a very long time, who talks about um, the same ideas that are discussed in um, in central place theory and, and, and similar traditional location theories, actually, so that we observe some, some system of hierarchy in space, very similar to the kind of uh, hierarchical structures we observe in, in even nature. Um, so one thing that um, is quite important that is known less and less to the younger generation of scholars, unfortunately, in our community is uh, how space is arranged in a, uh, in a hierarchical fashion. This idea dates back to, of course, German schools, starting with Pontunen and moving onwards with Kresscheller and Lösch. There's this idea that much like beehives, uh, space is organized in these hexagonal shapes that are rather durable and, and actually quite rational. If we think about the catchment areas and, and how uh, different services cater different parts of a population that are nested within a larger structure. And the idea is that depending on the service in question, this, this can be some retail service or a public service, we can see a, a hierarchical rank order basically between different types of towns. Uh, and um, the reason why they ended up with an hexagonal shape is rather simple. If you work with buffers, you would know immediately. And most of you that work with spatial data already are going to be very familiar with what I'm saying right now, that if you have a centroid, and if you draw a circle around it, uh, there's this obvious problem that whichever centroid you have, right, you would need to allow for overlapping trade areas or overlapping areas for, areas for, for these buffer-shaped markets. Uh, otherwise, if you assume them to be tangents, there would be areas that wouldn't be catered by any of the entities that are nested within these buffers, right? And when you allow these circles to intersect with one another, what you end up with if you actually draw rather lines between the points at which they intersect is an hexagonal shape. So it's a very, uh, it's a very evolutionary idea for why hexagons are, are rather stable structures and, and they're quite interesting to, uh, to think about. And, and they work in fractals too, right? And if you actually aggregate these, uh, if you actually aggregate these uh, hexagonal shapes, you end up with a complex structure that also looks like an hexagon kind of. Uh, and in the context of the arrangement of central places, um, a very just basic idea that whatever you find available in a lower ranked center is naturally going to be available in the center that is ranked above since there's this nesting structure, right? Uh, which leads to a, a natural thought around these neighborhoods being nested within different pockets of cities, cities being nested within regions, right? So, Interestingly, this idea, these ideas used by archaeologists uh, in their work, and it's very interesting to look at early settlements, for example, the Mayan settlements, um, that they know, for example, the location of a bunch of places in an historical settlement, but they don't know this, uh, they know the existence of yet another place uh, from the sort of writings or, or some special arrangements, um, so, so that they guess, basically, or they guesstimate based on these hexagonal shapes, where this lost city or where this lost location may be. Uh, and there are some really interesting work in, 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 um, in, in, in archaeology that sort of utilizes the idea of, of central place theory likewise. Of course, the structure doesn't hold in modern cities, in some of them that are overplanned or altered or shape of which are altered dramatically by, by intervention. But it's a, it's a very organic development of human population, it seems, uh, throughout history. So why do we need to work with neighborhoods? Um, we know these spatial hierarchies exist. Uh, these spatial hierarchies also imply that different mechanisms need to be captured at different spatial scales. So when we're talking about, for example, learning, um, it could very well operate at a spatial scale that is rather different from uh, matching, right? Uh, when it comes to labor markets, uh, labor market externalities associated with agglomeration then I need to identify logically, uh, but also empirically, the right level of geographical aggregation for me to capture whatever relationship I'm trying to uh, capture by way of my analysis. Uh, it's, it's really important for mechanisms. Uh, hence, it's important for policy, right? 
Um, the thing that is, I think, most valuable uh, as an economist to remember is, is opportunity cost. Every time you have some resources to be allocated to one policy intervention, that means you are not able to allocate those resources for some other potential policy intervention to tackle some problem such as immigrant unemployment, for example, right? And you need to understand the main source of problem, obviously, and also you need to understand at which geographical level this problem operates in order to design the right type of policy, uh, given that you have some limitation with the resources you can allocate uh, for different policy prescriptions. Um, and just beyond all of these things, actually, um, what is really interesting is, is ecological fallacy. So some of the patterns of, of inequalities uh, are not even evident if we actually operate at the urban level. In a, they call this term it's like post-urban. I, I don't understand exactly what it means, but I think if I had to guess what it means, I think it means that most of what we observe in terms of inequalities are nested within the cities now, uh, just as much as we observe them across different cities. So in order to avoid loss of information or reversal of information by over-aggregating information, we should sort of start from, um, from a small spatial scale and, and aggregate things up as a general practice is, is yet another idea. And of course, finally, built environment. If you are going to alter something by way of policy, one thing that people immediately think about is how to alter built environment, right? Rules and regulation around built environment, not only how it's built, but also how it can be used. And there, uh, you need to have some understanding of, of microgeography, again, at the sort of some understanding of the neighborhood. The empirics of, of neighborhood level analysis, um, I can point out a bunch of things, but I'm going to show you something that I am more familiar with. This is an in-group bias, you may call it, because I'm familiar with uh, the work that is done with Swedish data, since it's a fantastic geocoded data that is out there, everybody wants to work with it, and we were the we were the first group to work with it uh, in Yon Shopping. So I'm, I'm familiar with this work. That's why I'm showing this work. And it's not even my paper that I'm going to be showing to you right now, which is fine. I mean, I use this in my in my teachings um, quite a lot too. It's an empirical case for urban wage premium. Do, are you guys familiar with urban wage premium? So the, uh, the idea of urban wage premium, right? So here's agglomeration cities. Cities make people more productive or maybe not. Uh, we're going to get there in a second. Uh, so we observe comparable peers to earn more money for the same work in, in urban space than in less urban space, right? That's the idea of urban wage premium. But then there are also, so the idea was first introduced by Adna Weber in the 19th century, actually. Uh, and there are some really interesting quotes by even Adam Smith in, in The Wealth of Nations. But the empirical work, the way we think about quantitative analysis of urban wage premium, so one of the earlier works of uh, one of the earlier works out there is like Combat Al, for example, 2008, which report the average wage in Paris to be 15% higher than, than in other large cities. Glazer and Mare in 2001 reports at 33% urban wage premium for the United States. The more you move along the timeline and look at the empirical work later in the process, you see these estimations to be smaller and smaller and smaller. And why do you think that would be the case? because uh, of the obvious sorting and selection issues that people became better at dealing with, right? Uh, is it the city and the urban density that is making people more productive or simply more productive people are sorting themselves into cities and what we are observing is a sorting effect. So that kind of thing became easier and easier to tackle with better data and computational power. That's why I'm showing you um, a case an empirical case using neighborhood level analysis for urban wage premium. Uh, this is by Martin Anderson, Johan Klaasson and Johan Larsson, uh, a bunch of Swedes uh, who probably were one of the first people to put their hands on geocoded data that I use also a lot in my own, in my own work. And these people are also my co-authors in a number of papers in different combinations, uh, um, basically. So my, my scientific family, so to say. And they have this very nice paper that's published in regional studies, uh, super straightforward, how local are spatial density externalities, they ask. So the, these things that we talk about, uh, particularly in relation to learning mechanism in, in agglomeration economies, we talk about this as if it happens at the city level, but is it really the case that it happens at the city level? Or is it something that is far more local than the city itself? 
So these things that we attribute, like 15% urban wage premium, 25% urban wage premium, whatever it is in whichever geography you are dealing with, to the city itself, like Paris, London, Stockholm, Istanbul, wherever, is it really a citywide phenomenon or is it very much uh, localized in, at the neighborhood level is what they ask using, um, using geocoded data. And, and the nice thing that, that they can do is that they can discriminate between different uh, spatial scales. And what they find is that most of the um, uh, density externalities uh, are captured at the neighborhood level, even controlling for the region wide effects. They see that these things are very localized, that it attenuates, it attenuates extremely sharply if you move beyond one kilometer, right? This is such a, I think this is a very striking finding. And it was, one of the first sort of studies that could do this thanks to the data. It's not rocket science at the end of the day, it's wage aggregated at the neighborhood level against um, a population uh, controlling for even things like industrial composition, human uh, capital, um, et cetera. They find this effect to be rather persistent that it's a, it's a very local effect. So let's take this idea and see how we can apply to microgeography of ethnic enclaves. I'm going to steam through uh, four or five empirical cases that we have been dealing with to answer questions that are already asked. So we are not really claiming that the that there's anything original with the question itself, but I have been trying for the past three to four years, I've been trying to come up with different ways to solve this empirical mystery that is really an empirical mystery, because when you look at the um, relationship between ethnic enclaves and labor, different labor market outcomes, depending on the geography, timeline, uh, the type of immigrants in question. Um, you sometimes find positive effects from ethnic enclaves, you sometimes find negative effects from ethnic enclaves, so that there is this ambiguity in the literature in terms of the empirical findings. And yes, I'm using that data, the Swedish registry data covers everybody in the population uh, from 1992 onwards it's geocoded I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to pin them down to 250 by 250 square meter grids and I not only know where these people work but I also know where they live so that I can have these diets between their work location and residential location which then again gives this nice room to play with right with regards to some of the questions that are already asked but wasn't that, that weren't possible to answer um, in the literature one of the first things we did uh, and this question became something that i've been interested in as an immigrant myself in sweden back then uh, sweden was struggling a lot with um uh, with immigration uh, starting from 2006 onwards but actually it has a history of immigration even after the balkan wars uh, after, after the Yugoslavian war uh, in 1992 to 1993, there was this huge wave of immigration from the Balkans. After the second Iraq war, there, was, there were a lot of Iraqis that came um, during the Syrian uh, refugee crisis, as, as it's dubbed uh, now, Sweden received more refugees per capita uh, than any other member states, basically. And, and even in absolute numbers, it was the third largest. Uh, so it's a small country, you may think so, in terms of relative concentration, it may be high, but even in absolute numbers, it was pretty high. And uh, interestingly, of course, after the Netherlands, unfortunately, Sweden has the highest labor market gap between immigrants and the native population. So that's a big problem, right? On the one hand, you have obvious problems with integrating uh, these people into society, which often happens by way of, uh, by way of uh, labor market participation, according to a very large body of economic and sociological work that uh, tells us it's incredibly important uh, for, for immigrants to have uh, at least one foot in the, in the labor market, to, to, to be and feel like uh, in, insiders. Uh, Sweden, countries like Sweden and Netherlands and Belgium and, and so on seem to be doing rather poorly. So we, we also showed how in so this was a, um, by the way, this was a, a chapter that was com um, in a book that was commissioned by the permanent representation of Sweden in Brussels, where we examined sort of how EU wasn't prepared in terms of its common asylum policy when it comes to geographical distribution of uh, geographical distribution of, of, of uh, refugees during this during this period. And an interesting way, for example, every country had a way to deal with it themselves. In, a, in another paper with another colleague, we show 
how most of the refugees that arrived from 2014 onwards, for example, or from 13 onwards uh, from Syria were placed in places that were in decline. So most of these people were heavily concentrated in, in areas that had housing available, let's say, but also have been declining in their absolute population over a very long period of time, a, a, a sort of a recipe for disaster, right? Um, and it's a completely reverse trend we observe compared to labor migrants that come from similar regions, for example, who sort themselves, if it was up to them, to areas that are vital labor market areas. But in the time of crisis, because housing had to be prioritized, most of these people were placed in, in places where, with housing availability. And where is housing available in places that are that are uh, declining in their population? So um, in the following paper, we said then, OK, so we see these awkward trends in this country. Uh, it's a very interesting case. And also, we have the data for it. So let's, first of all, do an exploratory analysis. And this is a paper by me and Johan Klaasson, was my previous um, thesis supervisor basically from Yuan Shopping, we just, we were curious, uh, honestly, and we didn't even know whether we, we would publish this uh, initially. Uh, first of all, we were extremely bothered by the fact that in the literature, the terms ethnic enclaves and segregation were used quite interchangeably, and they mean two distinctly different things, right? While ethnic enclaves relate to the concentration of um, an ethnic or ethnocultural population in a delimited area, segregation is about a distinctly different population distribution in an area compared to the larger area it is nested in. And, and given the nature of the definition uh, and how different they are for these two things, uh, the kind of mechanisms that they would capture would be also dramatically different. So ethnic enclaves are not necessarily things, in my opinion, to battle against, but segregation is not a desirable outcome, right? So you can have high ethnic sort of you can have notable ethnic enclaves without really high segregation, technically speaking, actually, because they're measured in different ways. Again, uh, segregation is often in the literature measured by way of a dissimilarity index that looks at the relative distribution of the population again in that area with respect to the larger area. And you can define these areas at different geographical levels. Right. How is neighborhood different than the city? How is neighborhood different than the region, for example? are two different ways of measuring segregation in an area. Whereas in, ethnic, uh, as, uh, whereas in ethnic concentration, you just take a unit of observation, a spatial area, and look at the relative concentration of um, a subpopulation in that area. This can be ethnic concentration, concentration of a particular occupation. We like to create enclaves. I mean, I'm living in an enclave in Cambridge. It's like every other person around me is associated to the university. That's a that's a Cambridge enclave, that's a, that's a university enclave, for example. And, and most of the time, people actually sort themselves into these, into these enclaves, right? So we wanted to, don't read this, guys. This is a reminder for you. This is as bad of a slide as it can get. Uh, you, will, you will have these slides, I promise. Um, sorry, the, the door um, rings. So um, what we try to do is to um, read through the literature, the existing literature, and try to see uh, which mechanisms are associated with segregation often and which mechanisms are associated with uh, ethnic enclaves and also if we can discriminate between different uh, spatial, seg uh, spatial um, aggregations. So just to give you an idea, uh, ethnic concentration at the, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I need to let the dog up. One second. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, there's a dog crisis. <laughs> no, I'm not accustomed to having animals around me. Um, so just to give you an example, having ethnic enclave, a strong social network around you, you are new to the country, you don't know anything about anything, and you have all these peers around you in your neighborhood, easy access to information, right? So it can be a positive thing for labor market integration of an immigrant, or at the very least, um, being a labor market market uh, insider, so having the first contact with the, with the labor market, whereas segregation, you are then saying something different about the nature of the of the neighborhood. You you are saying pretty much, okay, so this area is dramatically different than the area it is nested in. The city itself doesn't have that many immigrants, but this area has way fewer natives than what you observe in the city itself, and way more immigrants than what you observe uh, when you look at the distribution of immigrants in the city or in the region, basically. It's, it's a really dissimilar area. So it can actually 
signify, they argue, uh, social separation or separ separation from the native population, um, some certain degree of isolation. Um, Borjas, for example, discusses this um, or juxtaposes these two things as ethnic capital on the one hand, lock-in effect on the other hand, right? So things that you can capitalize on versus things that keep you away from, from uh, your fortune into a better integration pathway. So we actually uh, calculated these two things at three different spatial aggregations, um, controlled for a bunch of things for two groups of immigrants, Middle Easterns that migrated um, prior to actually uh, the second Iraq war and um, to capture some degree of settlement. Don't worry about endogenate or anything. Again, this is just an exploratory thing that we're trying to do here. And then we have a bunch of Balkan immigrants that migrated in the 90s or in the 90s out following the Yugoslavian war. These are Serbians and Bosnians, basically. We control neighborhood size, municipality size, local labor market size to eliminate sort of size-driven, uh, supply-demand type of driven effects associated with the local market and look at the share of ethnic group in neighborhood, municipality, and local labor market, as well as segregation measured in three different spatial scales. And what we find is that the concentration of an ethnic immigrant group at the neighborhood level is, in, is negative, both for the probability of employment and for the probability of entrepreneurship. It turns out this is just the general size of the ethnic enclave at the neighborhood level does not seem to benefit uh, immigrants in terms of um, unlike what we expected to find in terms of the employment or the self-employment um, uh, pathways. Uh, when we look at uh, different geographical levels, ethnic concentration seems to have uh, mixed results. In certain situations, it's turned out to be positive. For example, citywide ethnic concentration seems to benefit immigrants in terms of their entrepreneurial activities. That's probably a supply uh, side argument that you can then start businesses that can cater these people kind of scenario we, we speculated with. Uh, whereas when you look at segregation, it's almost always uh, negative, if not statistically insignificant. So this was the this was the conclusion basically that we have to be very careful with how we measure these two things, and also it's important to take into consideration the spatial scale at which we measure them. Then we wanted to do something more serious uh, and do a little bit more detailed work on immigrant entrepreneurship. Uh, and its determinants at the neighborhood level. Because in the previous work that I showed you, ethnic enclave was measured in terms of the total number of ethnic peers in an area, right? Um, but, but there's this uh, there's this uh, discussion in the literature. Uh, Glazer, Kolka, and Sais has, uh, when ghettos are bad, this is a 2008 paper. I'm talking about just 13, 14 years ago, if you think about it. I mean, the empirical work on this on this question is not that old, actually. Uh, they start talking about when sort of being in an ethnic concentration can be beneficial and when being in an ethnic concentration can be um, uh, detrimental for the labor market integration of immigrants or maybe they uh, also they have things around like language proficiency and so on in their work. But they had the obvious problem, of course, that uh, they can't identify quality versus quantity in, at, the, at the neighborhood level when it comes to ethnic enclaves. So that's what we tried to do, Johan Martin and I, in this paper. So we wanted to uh, distinguish between sheer size of an enclave uh, versus its qualitative nature. So um, this idea came about uh, when I was having kebab in uh, Stockholm at Hayati's place. Hayati is the guy in this picture, the guy in the middle. He's a Kurdish guy from uh, from Konya running a place called uh, Amida, Ahmed. It's um, a, a, a Kurdish name for an Eastern city, Diyarbakir. Um, everybody works there, are immigrants from Middle East. Their common language is Swedish, by the way. Not all of them are from uh, Turkey at all, but all of them are from Middle East, basically. Um, Hayati had absolutely no, I, I don't think he knew how to break an egg before he uh, took over this restaurant, which was failing a lot, but it was in a very good location. And he's the typical, I would say, Turkish entrepreneur who has this incredible self-efficacy. Uh, it's kebab, how difficult can it be? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take over this shop and I'm going to go with it. He had some family savings that he could allocate, whatnot. And he actually is running now four kebab restaurants in the city. He's like a little kebab king, I call him. Um, uh, 
and this this place that was failing before turned into a celebrity uh, spot. Like Zlatan goes there often to eat and so on. So it's a very interesting story to me that 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 he ended up doing this thing that turned his life around basically alongside all of these people that he employs in this business. Um, and when I asked him how he came to know about this, I mean, what, why, how, how did he end up with the idea to begin with? He talked about this neighbor he had, who was also from Konya, that he was living around, um, who, who mentioned that this, this restaurant first needed a, an employee, and he ended up working there. And then he sort of was inspired by the idea of running a business. He realized very quickly that he could shuffle together the money and so on. But it was very specific, like how he accessed that information, how local that information was, not only in terms of uh, spatial uh, unit we are talking about, so being sort of living in the same area, but the fact that the people that he was in, in, in contact with had this type of experience or had access to this kind of knowledge, right? So we thought, okay, let's split the enclave into its two features. Let's look at its size, how many people from your country are living around you, but also let's look at how many of these people are actually entrepreneurs or they have any entrepreneurial experience. Is it really the sheer number of people that matters for your access to information or do you need to have already insiders around you? So people that are insiders already for them to be able to transmit this kind of information. So how can you transition from being an outsider, you are unemployed or you're jobless, let's say, into a, a labor market insider by way of self-employment, which seems to be a very popular alternative in Sweden for this particular immigrant group that has higher self-employment rates than even the natives. And I'm not just talking about being registered as self-employed, sort of being able to make meaningful income, sort of above sustenance level income through self-employment uh, activities. So we do this thing. We basically differentiate the size effect versus the quality, basically, effect um, by looking at the total number of immigrants and the total number of immigrants that are actually entrepreneurs to see through which channel this information is, is disseminated. An interesting visual representation of it is that if you actually look at 1,000 uh, by 1,000 grids, these are one kilometer grids, right? Uh, that if you dissect the geography completely exogenously, not, not following any administrative boundaries that are there for us to sort of know what the neighborhood is. Um, if you look at the total number of Middle Easterners uh, living in different parts of, of the city, it's not necessarily the same areas that pop up as the areas that are uh, quite dense when it comes to number of Middle Easterners that are engaged with an entrepreneurial activity, that are engaged in self-employment. So these are different types of neighborhoods, it seems. So places with the most number, the highest number of uh, immigrants from Middle East are not necessarily the places with the highest number of Middle Eastern uh, entrepreneurs. So this is the size versus quality thing. Here is an impossible to read uh, regression table, but don't worry about it because I summarized these results. But essentially the interesting thing, these are odds ratios, guys. Um, so interestingly, we find no general enclave effects uh, and most of the positive effects we observe over and above the citywide effect, by the way, because these are, um, or sort of there are city fixed effects here we observe. So that we look at the variation across different across different neighborhoods that are nested within the city. So whatever structural there is about the city is, is fixed, basically. Uh, it comes from uh, the share of entrepreneurs among the ethnic peers. Um, even in our specifications, we find a negative effect from the general size, basically. So no evidence of a positive general ethnic enclave effect. So these arguments around supply side um, the immigrants are more likely to start businesses where there's immigrant uh, demand. Even controlling for that, we observe that there's an information channel operating at the neighborhood level. And it's a very sizable effect also because a, a percentage point increase in the local concentration of ethnic entrepreneurs, for example, is on average associated with 5% increase in the probability uh, that a non-employed member of the group starts their own business. And if you look at the effect in terms of standard deviation, because you can actually scale this effect up so many times, right? By optimizing, at least theoretically, uh, among these many, many, many grids we have, thousands of grids we have in our data. So the effect of a one standard deviation change is 16%. So it's not that you should have a lot of immigrants around you, but 
uh, ideally they know something that they can transmit, that they can disseminate. Uh, and again, uh, these are over and above uh, individual characteristics. Uh, we find that length of non-employment spell as well as previous entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial experience, of course, matters. I'm going to speed up a little bit to show you some, some stuff more. Uh, with two other co-authors, we made an attempt at applying the same idea, but for wage employment, which is a little bit more tricky uh, because the kind of information exchange or the mechanisms that are discussed there are, are somewhat different. And the endogeneity issue seems to be a way larger problem, right? Uh, at least that's what the literature claims, that more able people sort themselves into better neighborhoods, hence it's rather impossible to uh, attribute any of the enclave characteristics on the success or the failing of, of an immigrant, that it could very well be the sorting issue that we discussed earlier in relation to urban wage premium literature. Um, so Johan Dieter and I, uh, this time uh, another Johan and uh, an Austrian uh, colleague um, from Real Mafia from Illinois. Uh, I know him not because we were there at the same time, by the way, because it's a, it's a really, it's a mafia, guys. I mean, everybody knows everybody. So I, I wholeheartedly encourage you to get in touch with one member. Then all of a sudden, by the time you think you're out, they pull you back in, basically. <laughs> it's, it's that kind of community. Um, anyway. So um, we looked into the wage employment, but here there was it was a little bit more difficult because then we actually had to employ a panel. Um, we had two groups of immigrants that arrived in two different points in time, Middle Easterns that came following the Balkan, uh, Yugoslavian war, I'm sorry, following the second Iraq war, as well as the Balkan uh, immigrants following Yugoslavian war to sort of tease out some of the structural changes that may have happened between those two periods, but also, uh, these are two completely different types of immigrants. One is more homogeneous than other, um, homogeneous one being the Balkan immigrants. And there's a more heterogeneous group that arrived following the Iraq war. And also we employed a bunch of very popular instruments that are out there um, that I'm gonna just mention in a second. Uh, but these are how the grids look, uh, if you guys want to see them. They are not very explanatory, but this is the concentration of sort of total population in the Stockholm metropolitan area, Balkan immigrants, as well as the Middle Eastern immigrants with respect to the total population. Um, we tried what every other paper that dealt with this problem tried, but they did it at the city level. Uh, there are these shift share instruments that you are familiar with probably they are also called card type instruments um, that became quite popular after uh, his work on Muriel boat lift and um, uh, the Cuban immigrants into into United States they are very problematic instruments in my opinion and I don't like instrumental variable variables in general uh, we can talk about that over beer sometime hopefully um, but we wanted to do a tidy work. And I think at the neighborhood level, these instruments, these shift share instruments work better because some of the structural changes that are argued to blur the accuracy of, of, the, of the procedure do not apply at the, uh, at the neighborhood level. And also we find very low correlation between the existing ability measured by pre-migration attain, uh, educational attainment and the overall education level of the neighborhood. So these people are quite randomly distributed in space um, in Sweden into different geographies through central placement policies, which gives us this really neat um, identification. And we observe them from point of arrival onwards. So you have this immigrant, voila, all of a sudden in T0, and you get to observe uh, their sort of unemployment spell and see when they become um, wage employed and what kind of wage employment that is also, is it meaningful? Can they self-sustain themselves and so on? So we, we tackled a bunch of questions like that. And again, um, we find something quite similar to the previous work I showed on self-employment with one, with one difference though, we find some general ethnic enclave effect. So we, we seem to see that overall size matters but what we find is that the quality of the ethnic enclave measured in terms of the employment share among your peers matter more, matters more basically. So again, this quality versus quantity uh, debate uh, we contribute to by way of this. Um, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes on these because these are cooking. Uh, and this is the paper that I've been working on the longest. It's been four years. I started to think that we will never be able to submit it. It's one of these Sagrada Familia cases, I think. 
um, because I'm writing it with this Austrian colleague of mine, Dieter. And Dieter, if you're watching this video at one point in time, we really need to submit this paper and say, say our sort of farewells to it. Uh, because we feel so excited about this paper, honestly. I mean, this can be a good paper the way we feel, but we may be exaggerating its potential because we are able to actually isolate for once this information channel that the literature talks on and on about. Um, we look at diets instead of residential location and some employment outcome. We observe the first job that an immigrant gets. Given that this immigrant gets his or her first job in the country after arrival, we look at where specifically, which grid of all these grids, this immigrant gets the job. And we try to estimate the probability that this individual of all these places in the choice set, this individual is going to find this first job in that particular location with respect to the number of ethnic peers in his or her residential location who already have a job there. It's a competitional problem from hell to begin with, because we're talking about peers of locations now, right? We don't have these grids as individual observations, but each diet is then an observation. And anywhere there's job is a, 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 within the choice set for any immigrant that is jobless at the point of arrival, which is all of them, basically, uh, that arrived from, uh, from, again, Middle East and, and Balkans. These are very two clear cut, very clean groups of immigrants that Swedes like to study because of historical reasons. And we use the idea uh, from Kramers and Skans. This is published in Restad, I think. Uh, but it's a standard labor paper without any spatial attribute or anything. But they talk about this, this information channel. They look at the um, young graduates and look at what kind of firms they end up with with respect to family members working there, whether family members' position in the firm uh, end up giving them a sort of a head start when they take their first job. And this is particularly important, they say, when the uh, information about available jobs are scarce and information about worker quality is really noisy, very similar to uh, immigrants at the point of arrival, right? Neither they have a lot to show for themselves in terms of their labor quality, nor are they in a position to acquire information about the available jobs. So we use this as an identification strategy, I'm sorry, and run some conditional logic framework. As you can see, everything comes from a bunch of beamers and PowerPoints. <laughs> this is like a goulash soup of, of things, basically. And what we find is rather interesting because we have diet specific variables and we have work location uh, characteristics, right? So even controlling for things like distance to central business district, uh, total num number of employees, sort of the employment potential in that area or specific employment potential or employment potential specific to this immigrant group, because it could very well be that there exists a sector in that area that favors Turks only, right? So that all of the Turks living here sort themselves into that area. So even controlling for all of these things, it uh, turns out that the effect from, sorry guys, it turns out the effect from having uh, so this one, two, three, fourth variable uh, under diet specific variables has the largest effect uh, that determines, given that you find your job, where you are going to find your job. And these effects are rather sizable. And we beat the data back and forth, doing all sorts of robustness checks to see if actually this effect uh, diminishes. One thing, for example, we do is to look at movers and stayers. We know that at least for the Balkans, these people were placed completely exogenously by a central authority to the first location we observed them in, because there's no existing uh, Balkan ethnic enclave prior to the Yugoslavian war in Sweden, pretty much, so that there's no path dependency. It's a little bit more blurry with Middle Easterners, but we can talk about that later. And uh, we find, in fact, that this effect doesn't vary between people that never move from the location that we observe them for the first time versus those that optimize their location several times. So the effect remains stable for movers and stairs. So we like to think that this is a, a, an evidence for information channel. I'll, I'll ping everyone up when this gets published, if it ever gets published, basically. So, and uh, another case that is cooking and I'm wrapping up, uh, these are the last couple of minutes for me because I have almost nothing to show uh, since I don't feel too confident about the numbers we have for this. 
with um, William Clark from UCLA, uh, Michael Corpy uh, from Stockholm, and a bunch of Swedish colleagues uh, from which we use data, we decided to undertake this project also that is that turned into not an easy walk in, in, in a park, uh, so to say. And we wanted to look into the tipping point literature. There's this huge issue with native flight or white flight, as they call it in the American literature, that if uh, the neighborhood ethnic concentration reaches to a certain point following the Schelling's type of um, sort of framework, um, one sort of immigrant or refugee into a neighborhood may not create any effect, five of them, 10 of them, whatever, then you reach a certain percentage beyond which um, you start observing a, a significant uh, demographic compositional change where actually the existing population starts moving out. A very similar story is actually found in sort of gentrification studies too, right? How many businesses need to turn uh, uh, before you observe some residential shift in an area. It's a very similar framework. We found that, Martin and I in particular, uh, the qualitative nature of these neighborhoods weren't incorporated into, into the analysis of tipping point very well. And that's probably, again, because when the ideas were being discussed, I mean, Will Clark is, I believe, at this point, 80-something years old, and Will... Uh, William Clark wrote about uh, tipping points and, and segregation. Tens, I mean, I think since the pretty much like 70s, very extensively, but the kind of analysis that was needed to capture the importance of built environment and amenities, that wasn't very easy to do given the data availability and computational power again. So we decided to actually look into, uh, first of all, nonlinear effects. Uh, and also how, for example, amenities and other features of the built environment can be a mitigating factor. So if you have two places with exposure to immigration in an identical fashion, but their built environment differs dramatically, the quality of built environment, quality of buildings, uh, but also things like crime rates, disamenities and amenities, green space, urban amenities, and all of these things, can we see actually the tipping point to differ between these two environments? do people tend to remain in locations that they find quote unquote nicer, even though there's sort of a high, a sort of a high exposure to immigration uh, is what we're trying to tackle. And our, unfortunately, our preliminary analysis, and this may change, please take this as a, so this is very off the record. Uh, our preliminary analysis suggests that um, they don't seem to matter too much. And that's not a, that's not a good news because we really hope to see. I shouldn't say hope to see because that would actually imply a bias, but reasonably we thought we would see that we would uh, find a much higher tipping point in nicer areas, right? That's what you would think. So that you can actually then go and tell policymakers, you know what, if actually, if you can improve this area, you can uh, sort of prevent excessive churn uh, of population that you can have a more cohesion, sort of a more cohesive environment somehow. But anyway, we, we are not done with beating the data yet. Uh, so um, again, this may not be an entirely robust result. Finger, fingers crossed, I don't know. Uh, because I mean, it is, if it is robust, it's, it's, it's a sad finding. It's, it's a heartbreaking finding for me at the very least. This is all I have for you today. I'm sorry for talking so fast, but I wanted to show as much as I can. Um, so I'm going to stop here now so we can chat. Is that all right? Yeah. OK, thank you very much, uh, Özge. Uh, I know there were some problems for, for a few of the participants at the very start of the uh, presentation. Uh, these were solved quickly. So I hope you only missed my introduction, in which I basically said that Özge is both a very good speaker and a good scientist. Well, you have experienced that yourself. So that means that you didn't miss anything uh, really important. <laughs> Uh, so it's now time to, uh, to go into the Q&A. We have uh, something like 15 uh, minutes for it. So if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand, uh, which can be done if you go to the participants button in, in Zoom. Uh, and I see that Emma is already raising her hand. So uh, Emma, hopefully you can unmute and then ask your question. Please go ahead. Hi, Emma. I can't, I can't hear you. Sorry. Yeah, great. Yeah. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah. Um, I would like uh, um, to thank you for your interesting uh, lecture. I am studying the determinants of um, environmental degradation, specifically on land consumption, from a special perspective by using a municipal units uh, as the unit of analysis. Uh, one of the main results uh, um, achieved the um, concern the key role of local institutions in managing land use. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, um, in light of the concept of sharing, uh, Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, administrative planning uh, focused on uh, the share of responsibility among an uh, adequate number of local authorities uh, can help reach a more sustainable level of land and uh, more in general environmental management, or it would uh, better undertake individual action by each territorial unit? Uh, which geography is this? Well, for which country are you studying this? Italy, for Italy. A, that's very good because I had a viva very recently on the multi-governance structure in Italy and I had to learn a lot because I had to read the thesis very carefully. So it's a country that I know something about. And it's interesting because you guys have this informal uh, collaboration scheme between different municipalities that are not superimposed by the central authority, right? That different municipalities can actually decide to collaborate on, yes. on a number of issues with regards to public governance. Uh, and the, the thesis uh, I've observed so far for Italy, and I have no idea how the actual quantitative work on it uh, appears to be, for smaller municipalities, places that are relatively in decline, it's seems to actually benefit them a lot to have a larger territorial collaboration. Or that's what my Italian colleagues say. Uh, and I like to think that they know what they're talking about. So um, I don't know anything more than that. So it's a very secondary source for me, but in the Italian case, it seems to be a, a regional territorial approach to, to these problems in general, not necessarily perhaps for environmental sustainability alone, but for things like uh, public service governance and so on. The way I see the research coming out of Italy, my inclination is to think that for most of the smaller areas, a larger territorial area, uh, sort of a higher collaboration uh, or higher spatial aggregation uh, seems, seems to benefit them quite a lot. Um, but I'm, I have very limited otherwise information on the actual metrics of it. So I've never worked with, with that kind of data. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I would be very much willing to see your work on the other hand, of course. Multi-level governance is a very interesting thing to read about, about anything really, I think. Yes. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Please yeah, like raise your hand, so anyone. I'd like to get to know you guys, even if you don't have a question related to what I talked about. Uh, but it questions are coming up. up. Uh, Felipe, <laughs> Felipe, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. I, I just thank wanted you. to ask you if you could possibly explain again the tipping point, what, what, what oh, we yeah. mean and how to measure it specifically. Yeah. So you have an area, uh, I mean, Schelling's idea in the 70s is that you have an area that is, um, I mean, that's used a lot for entrepreneurial clusters also, so it's portrait type of clusters and so on too. You have an area and all of a sudden some local guy invests in, uh, some woman starts a factory there, right? Uh, and that inspires some other investor to start another factory nearby. And then it becomes that two more factories start in the same area. How many of them need to move into this area before you start observing uh, the moving out of existing activities, right? Forget about population in the first place. So what is the tipping point for us to observe a significant compositional shift that it would allow us to call this place an industrial cluster? Let's say this factory was a textile company, right? The initial one. And how many of those need to move into this area before we start observing the other type of economic activity moving out so that it becomes this, this important cluster. As the similar idea is of course applied to things like gentrification uh, with regards to income composition, right? How many, uh, 
quote unquote, rich people need to move into an area before it becomes completely unsustainable for the uh, relatively low income people to live there so that you start seeing the moving out of these people. Hence, then you say here you have a place that's gentrified. Very similar to this, you have the same thing in segregation literature. You have a previously rather homogeneous area with a lot of native uh, people. All of a sudden, there's an exogenous shock. I mean, these refugee crises are horrible things to observe, but for a researcher, then is, is a good opportunity to observe these things in an exogenous fashion, because all of a sudden you have this big wave of immigration that has nothing to do with the neighborhoods, neighborhood also, right? Because it's completely push driven, it's forced migration, population displacement, however you'd like to think. Then you put 10 people in that area, you put 50 people into that area. And I say put explicitly because often these things are managed by the central authorities, right? Or local authorities. How many of these people need to move into this area? Unfortunately, when you, uh, when you start observing the native population to move out. In the literature earlier in the 70s and so on, they called it white flight because it was a very American-centric, US-centric literature with like the gatification of certain areas in the United States. And now it, they call it native flight. But the tipping point idea can be implemented in 1 million different ways for any kind of cluster formation or compositional shift. So that's what we're trying to estimate. What's that, what's that percentage? Um, everybody's trying to crack that number. That seems to be um, unfortunately as low as 5% in Sweden at the neighborhood level. So anything be above 5% of a co-clustering of immigrants seem to trigger uh, moving out of the existing native population. Uh, but what we wanted to do is not just find the number, but rather see if this number dramatically is different between places of different qualities, right? If you, if you see this number higher, or we hope, I mean, again, we hope to see this number to be rather high in places that are nice. I mean, I've seen the ethnic enclaves in Canada and I would very much love to live in one of them, I thought, uh, regardless of which ethnic enclave it was, because they were incredibly nice neighborhoods to be in, in terms of the built environment, the buildings, all the amenities around it, all those wonderful restaurants and the sort of the multicultural uh, vibe around the places. And you can find a similar sort of similar neighborhood in terms of the level of concentration, but maybe it's not that nice of a neighborhood, and then it may repel you for some reason as a native to, um, to towards the neighborhood. This is that's the idea roughly. Are you happy with the answer, Felipe? Yes, very happy. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, before we turn to the next question by Sasha, if you have uh, questions, please raise your hand. Um, in the meantime, Sasha, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, well, thank you for the presentation. Um, just out of interest, when you presented your results for the entrepreneurial uh, study, um, mm -hmm. I think you found quite a significant effect for the male-female uh, uh, dummy, right? Yeah. Did you investigate this further? And can you maybe elaborate a bit on that? Because no. that's pretty interesting. Um, whatever we do, a huge difference between uh, female and male population, much larger for the Middle Eastern cohort than it is for the Balkan immigrants. Um, actually, the female participation into labor market among the Balkan immigrants is by a landslide higher than the Middle Easterners for um, one million different reasons, I'm sure. Um, we find very significant effects between these two groups and I'm doing there exactly what I actually criticize the literature to do is just use a dummy variable to classify two groups and assume that the underlying factors do not differ between these two groups because that's what a, well, that's what a binary variable is, right? I mean, you assume constant variation across groups. Uh, so you assume that male subpopulation is just as heterogeneous or homogeneous as the female subpopulation, and that's often not the case. So one thing that I think I would like to do is rather than juxtaposing these two or comparing these two subpopulations, perhaps do a mixed method uh, analysis, have people that know how to do proper qualitative analysis with me, uh, because I don't, uh, um, and uh, look into the female specific determinants of self-employment or, um, or, or, or employment with respect to ethnic enclaves, because I don't necessarily think that they're going to appear to be the same as the male population. Um, we, unrelated, 
uh, and actually one of my quarters is here, uh, Allied, uh, hello. Uh, so we did, we did this work, uh, Evelyn, Allied, Maria Abra and I, uh, for entrepreneurial well-being. And in, in London, we talked to some people actually, and it was very interesting when we talked to people that sorted themselves into self-employment, uh, women start talking about things that were completely different, like their motivation, the well-being effects compared to their male peers. And it was often about um, sort of the community help that they were able to get with respect to childcare, um, being able to have um, a home out of which they could operate turned into a, an extremely important determinant, for example, that no other that male inter uh, participant be interviewed even mentioned. Uh, so being able to be at home and work from home turned into this, this important determinant and a bunch of other things that wouldn't be obvious to me, to be honest. Like I was quite oblivious towards um, that that appeared when we were talking to them. So that's the way I would want to look into that problem in the future if I can ever clean the pipeline. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Be Are ready there, to check, uh, by the way. Thank you for bringing it up. I mean, I didn't even mention it. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sasha. Are there other questions? Someone. Uh, Gijs, please, Gijs, go ahead. Hey, uh, thank you for your presentation. I also work with uh, uh, Swedish data, so it's very interesting to see what somebody else does. Um, but I was wondering about like the uh, assumed naturality of the, the hierarchy that you have in your theory. It might be a little bit nitpicky, and I think it's very pragmatic to use neighborhoods. Again. But I was wondering, do you, what, what level of neighborhood do you use in Sweden? Is it deso omrade or smaller? I make my own neighborhoods. <laughs> okay. Uh, so when I say a neighborhood, I don't rely on often. I mean, one of the papers I showed, uh, particularly the one with measurement and spatial aggregation, this thing that the, one of the first papers I worked on um, where we uh, compared the results from uh, a dissimilarity index to a basic concentration index, basically. There we used Samsomrode. Uh, but in, in, in anything else you see, we use the geocoded data to construct our own neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods are exogenously assigned. They don't follow some path dependent definition of what a neighborhood is. So depending on the question, sometimes I go with the smallest aggregation I can use, 250 by 250, particularly with um, uh, questions related to crime and disamenities, for example, that seems to be a more stable level of aggregation since it's very, very local. Uh, but things like social networks, peer effects, and so on, we want to have something that is walkable, right? An area that would allow you to get to know who lives around, basically. And there we use often one kilometer by one kilometer. So we we, we use the geocodes. Right. What do you Thanks, what yeah. do you what do you use? Um, K nearest neighbor clustering, so people based, because this is kind of different in Sweden, right? So hundred. Uh, or like one kilometer is quite a bit in Stockholm, but not in uh, Jämland. So uh, I use that's why, have, yeah. that's why you need city fixed effects if you are working with neighborhoods. You can't hmm. compare a neighborhood in Jämland with with a place in Stockholm. You yeah. all, I mean, all, you are required to work with city fixed effects then. Cool. Thanks for your answer. Where, really where are you? Where are you based, guys? Uppsala. Nice. Uh, at the econ department. No, no, at the uh, geography department, there is one. Oh, so my, one of my uh, co-authors in this very last paper, the tipping point paper, is just moving out of the... Yeah, John is, I recognize John is, Yeah, catch. John is yeah. one of, one of the co-authors in that paper. It's a small world, I, I told you guys, it's a, it's a yeah. very small world. Good yeah. luck with everything. I'm looking forward to seeing more work coming out of that, that, that bunch. It's a very interesting, very, very interesting place, actually. Thanks, thanks. Thanks for your answer. Okay, we have time for one very quick final question and one very quick reply by Uske. So if you have a pressing question, please raise your hand. No pressing questions yet. Anyone? If nobody has a question, I may I say something very quickly. So I was a, no. a summer school participant in Umeå in Sweden in 2011, I think. And um, 
I have to say, some of the people, I mean, that I, I met there uh, turned into lifelong friends and, and collaborators, and we talk with one another, um, and we go to each other's weddings, and, and it's, it was a it was a very interesting sort of introduction for us to be a part of the community and you get together during the bigger conferences and you go out and, and, and have fun and share the misery of PhD life. Uh, so I hope, <laughs> I hope, I hope you guys have a, a little enclave of your own uh, through this, through this event. So I very much encourage you to get together in person in the first in person ARSA event, if, if you can, um, I, please do that. It's, 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 a, it's a great opportunity, actually. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Özge, both for these uh, these words and also for the, the very inspiring uh, talk. I, I think that the, the number of questions that came and the, the shows that this is a really interesting work um, on which uh, people can uh, can build. Unfortunately, the data situation is not everywhere like like it is in Sweden, but still, I think uh, lots of work can be uh, can be done. So thank you very much. We hope to see you uh, at uh, physical conferences again soon. Um, so do I. So do I. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time for uh, for a break now. Um, so all participants are uh, uh, invited to uh, to join a conversation group during the, what we call the networking uh, break, um, which will uh, be until eleven thirty uh, Dutch uh, Dutch time. Uh, you can virtually network uh, there. Uh, so go to the uh, ERSA uh, platform and from there you can uh, click on the join button on the networking break. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Uske, and uh, see you. I thank you. I thank okay. you all. Um, hope to see you 